welcome to Adapt and Close. Thank you for following with this series. We've done two I yield fact questions on Enkler's concept for maternity. Now we want to look at how, when they give you a case study, how do you attack it? I have five good case studies. Some of them are three, four, five questions. They are not complete six questions, but they are I, things I think you need to know. So stick around, look at the way I'm going to tackle these case studies. I call them buzzwords, the cues and the management uh, for this case study on maternity. The first case study is straightforward and see what I'm going to do. Look at the way I'm going to approach it. Looking for the buzzwords, G1, P0. Every time I see a first pregnancy, I'm worried about it. Something can happen. She's 30 weeks old. Weeks. You present to the labor and delivery with what? Painless buzzword, bright red vaginal bleeding. The prenatal care has been what? Unremarkable. So she's been doing fine. Client had report of sex two days ago. This is a distractor. This is a distractor. This is the reason why she came. So don't worry about it. Vital signs. Temperature, 98. Heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, saturation, all of it normal. You see, I wrote normal here. Abdominal exam, the uterus is gravid. She's pregnant. 30 weeks. She has no tenderness. Whenever you see no, don't run away. Think at it as if that's a key fact to rule out other stuff. Ultrasound, they get ultrasound what? Cervical ox is covered, covered with what? Forceta robbery structure. What do you think this is it? The nurse knows that the client is experiencing what? This is a full case study you will get. Look at the way I've approached it. I've circled every password. Then you go back. First pregnancy, you analyze it. R painless, bright red blood. This, this is a buzzword, number one. Something should be ringing in your ear and say, this I know. A prenatal um, care has been unremarkable. She had sex two days ago, but there was no bleeding. All of a sudden, there's bleeding. No, it's not a cause of it. The virus is normal. She has no abdominal tenderness. And what do you do when you get an ultrasound? Something is pulsating. It has to be a vessel. And what structure is robbery and pulsating? This is placenta. Where is the placenta occupying? It's occupying the cervical os. Wrong position. That is why the client is bleeding. What do we have? Lady who is not treating abortion. Treating abortion doesn't present like that. Okay. Placenta abruption is going to have abdominal pain. Placenta previa, that's your answer. Placenta accreta, yeah. We usually have the placenta embedded to the wall of the of the uterus, not at the cervical os. Even if you think this is a threatening abortion, ultrasound will not show you that there's a positive mass at the cervical os. They can give you this question and try to trap you. You stick with your gun. If I get an ultrasound that shows the Placenta is covering the cervical opening. Is placenta previa until diagnosed otherwise? And she has painless vaginal bleeding. So that's our answer. This is how you approach the question. And now that I know is what? Placenta previa. Every question, I'm going to answer it in the lens of placenta previa. So the next one. Now, what do you do? Same case, right? Which of the following is indicated or not indicated? I know the case, I don't, I repeat it for you, the same thing. If I have placenta previa, there should be no vaginal exams. You're going to bleed. Yes, bed rest as you recover. Type and cross. You're bleeding, we need to cross match you so that in case we have to give you blood. You can even do RH positivity to make sure that the mother is no RH positive or negative. So this is it. You need two gauge, 25 gauge IV. She's bleeding. You're fundamental. What would 25 gauge do to you? Wrong. You need 18 gauge. You don't resuscitate any patient with 25 gauge. It's between 14 to 18 gauge. Usually we put 18. If you have 16 too, it's good. So this is not indicated. Emergency C-section? No. Usually 
this patient can be observed for, and if they continue to bleed before you take them to emergency C-section. So these are those indicated, and these are those not indicated. Now, which teaching is appropriate at discharge? That means patient did well going on. Which teaching is appropriate? We, now that we know is what? Uh, placenta previa, not to go into the vagina anymore. So no sex is appropriate. She needs to check her parts so that we know that she's bleeding. She needs to come back to the hospital 36 weeks and we get an ultrasound. And if, if the placenta has moved, we can delay and then deliver the baby at 37. But if the placenta is still at the cervical horse, she's going to get C-section. So we need to do ultrasound at 36 weeks. Report if changing parts every hour. I don't want you to report if changing your parts every hour. Okay? I want you to call me as soon as you start changing your part. If there's a little blood there, you're still bleeding. Okay? Report if changing parts every hour is not good. Okay, I want you to don't wait until you change your part every hour. I want to see what whenever you have some bleeding, just let me know. So don't call me until you're changing your part every hour. When you see little blood, you still bleeding. I want I discharge you because the bleeding has stopped. Therefore, don't do that. Report to L&D only when in labor. We don't want you to be in labor. I want you to be in the hospital at 36 weeks before even you start contracting. When you go in labor and you come to the L&D, the placenta is going to be in trouble. So don't come in until you have a, you are in labor. No, I want you to come in before labor starts, before the contraction starts. So this is not indicated. I know people will say, hey, report if changing part every hour. We don't, I don't want you to change your part every hour. Okay. I want you to call me if you see one blood again. Yeah, let me know because I think you're still bleeding and we have to worry about it. Changing part every hour is like too late. That means you're saturating. So that's bad. And that's the first case. Oh, second case. What do we have? Same strategy, G1P0, 34 weeks climb, admitted to, admitted, admitted due to what? Headache, periorbital edema. Blood pressure was what? 150 over 80 at 23 weeks, right? And it has been persistent. So blood pressure is still elevated. What is the blood pressure admission? Temperature is fine, heart rate is okay. Still hypertensive, respiratory rate is going up. Saturation is a little bit and uh, is normal. What did you see on exams? Uterus is gravid. So she has a baby there, but there's no tenderness. And magnesium drip was initiated. We give her magnesium because of something, right? I didn't want to give the answer away. Three hours later, this is a temperature. Her heart rate is going up. Bra pressure is dropping. Respiratory rate is dropping. Saturation is dropping. These are bad way. This is how you analyze the case as you go. You see, I'm not boiling down. I'm just un underlying things I think is important. A urine output, too low. Deep tender reflex, down. What do you think the client is experiencing? First pregnancy, 34 weeks, I've been having headache and organ damage and peri orbital edema with hypertension at 28 weeks. So 23 weeks. If you get diagnosed before 20 weeks, is what normal? I mean, uh, hypertension after mid 20 a week, it become a problem, and she has what issues with the end organ hypertension, periorbital edema. This is what pre eclampsia. Okay, she has no seizure, so it's not an eclapsic episode. They don't give you UA, but if they give you urine analysis, you may see some protein. The pressure is still high. And that is why we initiated magnesium. And when we initiated magnesium, what happened? Blood pressure is normalizing, but what? Look at it. Respiratory rate is down. Deep tender reflex is down. Saturation is less than 95%. Okay. And blood pressure 
is becoming hypotensive. Urine output is less than 25 ml per hour. These are all signs of what? Magnesium toxicity. You have to know your content and then you can figure out it. This is a magnesium toxicity. She's already was in pre and classic, and we started magnesium. So that is not the problem anymore. Don't get trapped. She, we already know she has pre and classic from the beginning. Eddie can carry orbital edema. But when I started magnesium before all this thing happened, vitals is dropping and changing. Therefore, don't pick this. She has no seizures. Therefore, she can be in classic. Magnesium is toxic. F syndrome, she's supposed to have right upper quadrant pain and some LFT changes. So this is it. I never give you that. So this lady is in what? Magnesium toxicity state. That's your right answer. Therefore, what do you do? You know she's in magnesium toxicity. In these kind of questions, when you figure out the problem, take it with you. Don't let them trap you. I know in my mind, this patient has what? Magnesium toxicity. I'm not going to change my mind. No matter what information you give me, I want to make sure it confirm that process. That's how they do case study. Therefore, select two. I say select two priority next actions. What actions will you take? Magnesium toxicity. Brow pressure is dropping. Heart rate is going up. Respiratory is dropping. SAT is going up. Urine apples is going down. Deep tendon reflex is going down. Because high magnesium, the same signs and symptoms is decrease symptoms. Everything, it depresses the nervous system. Okay, that's why we use it. So that you don't have seizures. Seizure means your nervous system is excitable. You want down going symptoms. So that's bad. And it has gone down too much. So provide oxygen for the patient, or you want to do emergency C section, stop the infusion, seizure precaution, give calcium, gluconate, and monitor deep tender reflex. Prioritization. You have to learn my B sharp, and this will be easy. Okay, I'll give you oxygen. Does that fix this problem? No. Magnesium is still going. Emergency C-section, no, we already initiated magnesium, so she's not in eclampsia, so this is already gone. The poison we're giving her to get her sick, we need to stop it. So this is your answer. Whenever you give something to somebody who gets sick from it, stop it. Seizure precaution. Magnesium toxicity will, will, will not increase your seizure. I told you when you have high magnesium, symptoms go down. When your magnesium is low, yeah, you have risks of seizure goes up. So there's no way she will go into seizure. She has magnesium toxicity treated with calcium gluconate. That's the antidote. I know the deep tender reflex is going to go down. The question asks you what? Action. Keyword, password, actions. You need to do something. Don't monitor things. When he asks you to do something, do something, not monitor. That's the king strategy. So this is gone. So what you need to do to act action, stop the infusion and give calcium gluconate to take care of this toxicity. Number three. No, the same question, but part three. Which of the following plan is appropriate, not appropriate? Now, what plan did you go total? You have your priority, but you got to take care of the patient. The same case, right? Check serum magnesium level. Yeah, you want to know the level, how high it is. You saw the respiratory rate is going down. Yeah, you need to monitor, monitor that status. Yeah, level, it depresses your nervous system, your neuro neurological system, magnesium. So monitor your loss uh, level of consciousness, okay? You're giving them lorazepam. What? They are not in seizure. Seizure, when you have seizures, you give them lorazepam to prevent seizures. The lady is not in seizures. She's already even going down. She sees the threshold is so high. You don't need that. Don't give them seizures medication. They are not uh, in clumsy. Number three, case number three. That's what I'm telling you. G1P0, 37 week was induced with what? Pitocin. She came in induction. 
She has no past medical history and surgical history. So I know the toxin induction. What is a virus? Everything looks normal for me here. Clean virus. So I put what normal. What is the abdominal exam? She looks pregnant. She has no tenderness. Okay, labor is going well. Guess what? One hour later, client reports what sudden bad weight, onset of what severe abdominal pain. You check her heart rate is 120, systolic blood pressure 80, abdomen rigid like a board, loss of fetal station. You can find the fetus. If this is where the fetus is, if it's like minus one or minus uh, uh, plus one, now it's back to like minus three, it's doing, going the wrong direction. Cessation of contraction, no more usual contraction. There's multiple fetal deceleration. The baby is not doing well. What do you think? What do you think? G1 on Pitocin, summarizing. When you find your bad words, go back, summarize it, summarize the case, and take it with you. First pregnancy, Pitocin reinduction, all of a sudden, sudden onset of she has abdominal pain, tachycardia, hypotensive, rigid abdomen loss of fetal station, those are all bad ways you, you should be bringing, you should figure out the diagnosis right now. Cessation of urine contraction and multiple D-cell. This is not abruption. I will tell you she's bleeding dark blood, right? So gone. Placental preview, we saw it, painless vaginal bleeding. This is classic. Loss of fetal station, abdominal rigidity, cessation of contraction, multiple fetal deceleration, and mother is in shock. She has ruptured her uterus. Postpartum hemorrhage. She has not delivered the baby. How can she be in postpartum hemorrhage? That's the key strategy. Therefore, take this out. Number three is your answer. Okay, so what is your next priority? What would you do the next? What is the next priority action? What do you do? She ruptured a uterus and the baby is somewhere in the abdomen. Baby is dying. What would you do? Give her oxygen, supine position to help with the blood pressure? I don't know about that. Two, 18 gauge IV or chest surgery. What do you want to choose? Oxygen is not going to help her. Saturation was 98. There was nothing wrong with it. Supine position is going to worsen her blood pressure. She need to be resuscitated. And what is resuscitation? Large bowl IV, 18 gauge IV. S-ray is not going to help you. So two large bowl IV is what you need. Now, the nurse know that the first sign of uterine rapture is what? What is the first sign? All the bad that I gave you. Abnormal rigidity, loss of fetal space, cessation of uterine contraction. Multiple, right? Um, and fetal deceleration. This is abnormal, right? Or acute onset of abdominal pain or hypertension. All these things are bad with for uh, urine contract and uh, rapture. Is it loss of fetal station? Is it constant abdominal pain? Is it cessation of contraction or abdominal fetal at pattern? Who is going to be in trouble first? Baby or mother? Baby. So baby, when you wrap to your uterus, the baby basically get lost. He said, where am I? I'm lost. So you see fetal heart pattern, deceleration. They're going to diesel. They're going to Brady. And they demise if we don't do something. So that's the key for that. So our first sign for uterine rapture is abnormal fetal heart pattern. That's a concept you have to know. Case number four, highlighted information. Like I said, these are all cases I want to show you. You can be comfortable. I'm just showing you, there's so many OB cases they can ask you about. I pick few to give you cases. This is the way you approach it. If you're having issues with maternity, this series should be your friend. I've had two cases, two uh, questions already, and this one to help you go navigate through your studies. What do we have? 42 year old G0 P G1 P0, first pregnancy. There's a reason why she's 42, old patient. 
is a little bit middle age. And 26 weeks was seen for routine and prenatal care, routine one. Look at a BMI, 35. And she had what? She had gained what, 20, 20 pounds so far. That's the problem, right? And she also has polycystic ovarian disease. These always give you insulin resistant problem. The virus is normal. And we checked the abdomen, 26 weeks. It looked like she's pregnant, 26 weeks. We did a sugar because she's within the range, 24 to 26 weeks. One hour, she's 250. Almost double what is needed, too high. And then we did a, a thorough line test for um, three hours. She fell three high. She fell one hour random, um, one hour challenge without fasting. And three hours with fasting, still failing. What do you think? Which of the highlight information is concerning? Which one, the PMI, is concerning? She's getting 20 pounds is concerning. Okay, poly ovarian cystic disease is concerning. That's the risk factor for uh, a, a gestational diabetes. A uterus 26 weeks is fine. It looked the same size, right? And a blood glucose at uh, three hours 180. So this one is concerning. This one is concerning. That one and that. Age, everybody who is more than 42, 40 years old, you have to worry about it. But for this case, I'm not going to select it that much. It's a risk factor, um, but the, the best ones are the, because the BMI is high, um, she's gained 20 pounds, she has a disease process that will make her insulin resistant, and her blood sugar is low. So one, two, three, four are my right answers. Okay, which of the following is indicated? Now we know she's probably in gestational diabetes. Which one is indicated? Refer to dietitian, exercise program, repeat the one hour GTT, avoid glycemic um, carbohydrates which look like glycemic index or anticipated insulin. What do you think? Yeah, she needs to go and see dietitian, okay? Exercise is good to help with the insulin resistance. There's no need for you to repeat one or one. She tell you she's diabetic right now. So there's no need. It's not going to change your mind. Avoid carbohydrates with low glycemic index. This is what you want them to eat. Carbohydrate that has low glycemic index. So it does not cause the glucose to be high. So uh, this is bad. They should not avoid it. Anticipate need for insulin, yeah. They may need insulin if the, the life cycle, lifestyle that management does not help this patient, you definitely need some form of um, uh, therapy, medication to help with the glucose. Otherwise the baby is going to get into trouble. So one, two, and five are indicated. They should not avoid carbohydrates with low glycemic index. They should be eating carbohydrates with low glycemic index. And we should not repeat their, G, their one hour GTT. Normal. Case four, the same thing. Which of the following is a complication from the disease process? If you have gestational diabetes, what will happen to the baby? Baby get bigger and bigger and bigger and cannot pass the vaginal canal when you're delivering them, so you get shoulder dystocia. The baby will get bigger, you deliver like 10 pound baby, become a problem. The baby will grow and grow and then they can't, you can't deliver. Sometimes it takes a long time to go in labor and your baby will be post, post term. Usually people who are big, they get delivered 41, 42 weeks later. So it's a problem. It may need a C-section because it can pass through the vaginal canal. It has some injury. And when the baby is inside you, because of high glucose, okay, it causes the baby to secrete more insulin. So they make a lot of insulin so that they can get rid of the glucose. When you get born, 
they're still making insulin because they adapted to that, but they don't have glucose anymore. So the little glucose they have, they push everything down, it become hypoglycemic. So neonatal hypoglycemic after delivery is a complication to uh, get, get sustained diabetes. So that's a big problem for these babies because the insulin, insulin is high, but now they cannot get any in glucose. So the little glucose they have, they destroy them and put them in the cell. Okay, so that is that case. That case four is done. This is the last case. G1, P0, same thing, 37.5 weeks, was admitted to deliver and delivery for plant induction. We want to induce them. We started the pitocin. Uh, was initiated and was used throughout the labor. Epidural was also used for pain management. Client at what? Colong labor. That means greater than 24 hours. They expect you to know that greater than 24 hours is prolonged labor. But eventually deliver what? A big baby, 10 pound baby. Two hours postpartum, what happened? This is the temperature. Heart rate higher, blood pressure going down. Respiratory going up, starts dropping. When you look at a client, she's anxious, she's sweaty, she reports dizziness. You check the abdomen, uterus is boggy, and it's two centimeters about the belly button. It's midline. What do you think? Which of this is concerning? What do you think is happening? Admitted for induction. And I go prolonged labor, they will deliver a big baby. Two hours later, she's in shock, tachycardia, hypotensive, respiratory rate is going up, telling you I'm in shock. And I'm sweaty, anxious, I feel dizzy. My uterus is like a balloon. And it's midline, that's good. So which of this is concerning? Midline is not concerning. We want it to be midline. Oggy, yeah, I hate you. Temperature is fine. Prolonged labor is concerning. That is risk factor for what? Postpartum hemorrhage. Epidural is done. Don't worry about it. Deliver 10 pound baby. Yeah, concerning. Big baby. It make the uterus more distended. So which one are concerning? Prolonged labor. Deliver 10 pound baby. In a boggy uterus. Midline uterus is good. Temperature is fine. Um, having epidural is not a problem. What do you think this baby lady had? Postpartum hemorrhage, basically, because of prolonged labor, prolonged uh, uh, um, use of pitocin, give birth to large baby, and a virus telling you a uterus is also boggy from ethanol. So that's the problem. Now, I already answered this question. The nurse know that the client is experiencing what? It's no pulmonary embolism. Why all of a sudden, all the things I tell you never talk about uh, respiratory status. You know that. So you shouldn't choose it just because she's what? Anxious diaphoretic. She's anxious and diaphoretic because she's in shock. Postpartum hemorrhage. Yes, that's what she's experiencing. Urine rapture, you saw it. There will be cessation of contraction, all those things. She cannot deliver a baby. And we already had a, I mean, she's going, you can see signs of urinary rupture. We saw it, loss of fetal station, all those things, and uh, fetal bradycardia and uh, deceleration. So this is going to be bad. Due to what? Not because of a saturation, not because of virus, think because of a uterine atony. This is what causes that. Those are signs, and virus are signs of what? The uh, uh, when postpartum hemorrhage, but look at the question. She's experiencing postpartum hemorrhage due to what urine atony because it get boggy, it get bigger, it, it cannot uh, distend. It's, it's supposed to be contracted while it's boggy, so you're going to any she had prolonged labor, she's going to bleed. So, due to that, in postpartum hemorrhage. Now, the client was diagnosed with postpartum hemorrhage. Which of the following is a risk factor? I already given you cues about this. If you undergo labor more than 24 hours, that can be a problem. 
pitocin is used for contraction, but if you use it for a long time, this the receptors become inactive. So it make the uterus uh, non-responsive for contraction anymore. So that's the risk factor. Big baby may dilate the uterus. First pregnancy is not a risk factor. So it's not. History of PrEP, otherwise a lot of people will go into hemorrhage. History of, even though first pregnancy usually it leads to pro, prolonged labor, you shouldn't extrapolate that long. If they want you to say that, they will tell you that. History of prior postpartum hemorrhage. Yeah, if you had one before, yeah, more likely you're supposed to have. So one, two, three, and five are your answer. If you don't know, just pick those you're confident but don't select everything. Client was diagnosed with postpartum hemorrhage. Which of the following the next should implement first? Priority, prioritization. You got to be sharp. And I said, select three. So you need to select three of this. Do you want to call rapid response? Do you want to give it something to con cause this con uh, uh, contraction of the uterus? Do you want to massage the uterus? You want to type and cross or you want to give it a bolus? She's in shock. Okay. When he asks you what you do first, fix the problem. Calling rapid response, I mean, they're going to assess the patient. You already know what the patient is in. I'm not calling them. The patient is in shock. Fix what you can to help with the shock problem. I'll give them the patient metallocopenbin. That will cause this constriction and help with the postpartum. I will massage the uterus. That is buggy. It will cause the uterus to become smaller, contract, and stop the hand. I'll type and cross, but it will take time. I don't have time. And I'll give you a fluid to improve the volume. This is the way you think. They, she has shock. Fix the, the problem. Which of this is going to fix the shock? Yeah, the three I've highlighted it. So two, three, and five. And this is the end of it. Thank you for staying around. Um, like I said, case study for all the things you need to know, but not all of them. Just a few how to approach these uh, case studies, especially maternal health. They can be very intimidating, but this is just to make it easy. Approach them like that. And you see, like you'll be golden. Just know your content and the rest will be easy. Thank you for sticking around. All the best of luck. Subscribe if you have not. Take care of yourself and keep charging as always. Bye-bye.